Thanks you're here. Good morning. Thanks that you joined us for the last day here on the keynote area uh, for our first uh, keynote in English. So if you don't feel comfortable uh, uh, in listening to English, please help yourself with uh, uh, translation, direct translation, or audio headset that you get right there. Um, glad you're here um, and talk about a revolution. Are we going to talk about how to address a problem that most of us know, of which the analysis has been done many fold, and that is how disengaged and how discouraged, how disengaged many people are at work, and how disencouraging a lot of the organizations are by not putting any emphasis on the question, how could work look like in a better world? And that is the question that the founders of corporate rentals wondered, asked themselves when they, self, they, uh, they themselves worked in large organizations that did just the opposite of fostering joyful work, but rather seemed to be specialized in creating frustration. So the two founders quitted their jobs and endeavored on a learning journey all over the world, visited organizations that thought work different than traditional top-down hierarchical organizations. And we're very pleased that Pim de Mora, I hope I pronounced it in a way that was still bearable for you, <laughs> excellent, is with us to tell us what their conception of changing the work world to a better is. Great you're here. Thanks, Pim. Thank you. All right, thanks for the kind introduction, Thomas. Thanks for being here today. I know it's a bit early. I know it's the third day of the conference, so I'm very happy to have you guys here. Um, while we are going to share some of the things that we've seen while traveling around the world, visiting workplace pioneers, as Thomas said, who we'll rethink the way, we, the way we and many organizations are working. But before we're going to do that, we're going to uh, put you to the test a little bit. So I'm going to put a few statements up on the slides. And I want you to stand up if you agree with those slides. And I want you to remain seated if you disagree with this statement on the slide. So yes, this is going to be one of those interactive presentations. Sorry for that. Um, the first one for you, most of our employees in our organizations are highly engaged. Stand up if you agree. So look at your own organization. Most employees, are they engaged? Stand up. If not, you can remain seated. All right. So about 50% of the people stand up. That's a good thing. good thing. We have quite an honest audience today. Most of the time, everybody stands up. But at least there are some people that dare to be honest here today. All right, second one. Employees are free to decide where and when they work. If you agree, stand up. Disagree, you can remain seated. All right, so just six people and a few from corporate rebels themselves. <laughs> All right, next one, teams select their own leaders. Who of you can select their own leaders in your organization? Anyone? No? Also not behind the pillar. Then I guess also for the next statement, nobody will stand up. Our employees set their own salary. Two people. One, you set your own salary? Yes. Self-employed? No? All right, then I'd love to learn more. Please share. You set your own salary in the organization? Yes. How does it work? It's, it's a small organization. I think this is the main point where it works. And we have a value-based system why we put in what environment our talents into the world. We work in communication, so our main slogan is no bullshit. And no bullshit is in the advertising surrounding quite a thing. So we all commit just to put our talents in no bullshitting. So it's also that we have to be aware what we think is adequate, what this job 
is paid for. So I, if I work for a big corporate, I have my own gut feeling what makes sense in the situation, in my situation, in their situation, and in the situation of the project, what I value myself. But the more interesting thing is that I asking, especially corporates or institutions don't have so big budgets, what is the value for you? I just did it last week. Somebody was very happy with the work. I did the work for free because I want them to judge the work by value. And then the lady said, we are super happy. How much do we have to pay for you? And yeah. I said, we make it the African way. The question is, how much is this valued for you? She shared her price and I accept it. Okay, nice. And yeah, that's definitely worth an applause. How, many, how big is the organization? How many people work there? Six. All right. Thanks for sharing that. So there are actually, as you can see, examples of organizations, even bigger ones as well, where employees are able to set their own salaries. So we're going to share some of these radical ideas of rethinking the way we work to actually make sure that people become more engaged and motivated in the workplace. All right. So we set out ourselves to start Corporate Rebels born out of personal frustration. So Joost and myself, we started. Uh, two and a half years ago, we decided to quit our job because we disliked the work so much. And we couldn't imagine ourselves working in such organizations for 40 more years. We were tired of the lack of freedom, the lack of a purpose of such organizations. And many other things that we disliked about the organizations that we worked in so much that we decided to quit our jobs to start looking for ways to make work more fun and to actually find ways to organize work in a different way in organizations so people become more engaged in the workplace. But the frustration that we experienced ourselves wasn't just a frustration of us. There were more people. And of course, we talked to friends and family, and we already noticed that there were more people not that happy about their workplaces. But looking at the da data, we became even more scared of how big the problem at the moment actually is. Do you have any idea how many people around the world in all different regions, different kinds of industries, are engaged in the workplace? Could you share? and shout out a percentage that comes to mind, the amount of people engaged in the workplace. 20? 30? 16? So the, mo so the most positive person in the room, 30%. That already says something, right? And it's quite painful. Apparently, we think that not even more than 30%, or let's say not even half the people, are engaged in today's workplaces, which in itself is quite a painful fact already. But when you look at the data, and we've looked at the uh, Gallup and the research that they do on engagement in the workplace, the results are indeed quite bad. 15% of the world's population is engaged in the workplace. Then there's a big category, 67% being disengaged. So they come into the office, uh, spend their time there, but not really their energy and their passion. Um, and then there's a the category of 18% who's actively disengaged. So those are the people that dislike their work so much that they start sabotaging the workplace by, for example, not answering emails, not doing the work they should be doing. In Holland, it's very popular to spend time at the coffee machine to avoid doing the work you should be doing. So a lot of things that actually go against what the organization wants a person to do because they simply dislike their work so much. What do you think for Germany? Better or worse? Who thinks it's better in Germany? Nobody? One person. Who thinks it's even worse in Germany? And the rest? Probably the same, more or less. Well, it is indeed correct, 15% as well. The actively disengaged group is a bit smaller, but more or less the same. Um, in Holland, the statistics are even worse, where we have only 10% of the people being actively engaged or engaged in the workplace. Um, so quite painful numbers, right? We started, to, we started Corporate Rebels to find a solution for this from a personal perspective. So how can we actually make sure that the 40 hours a week we spend at work is time we value and where we can challenge ourselves, develop ourselves, and actually enjoy the time we spend at work? But even if you don't care about that, even if you're one of those people that says work shouldn't be fun, Work is just there to be productive and to make money for the company you're working for. 
even then, it's interesting to focus on engagement in the workplace, simply because engagement and good results, so bottom line results of your organization, are highly correlated. So more engaged teams and organizations perform better than the ones that are disengaged, or even, especially if they are actively disengaged. Um, if you're a bunch of engineers by background, like we are, it's especially good to also have some data to back up this gut feeling. So once again, Gallup gathered lots of research studies, and you see that productivity and profit go up when teams and organizations are more engaged, and that absenteeism, accidents, and defects actually go down when people and organizations are more engaged versus when they are not. So even if you only care about the bottom line of organizations, still it's beneficial to focus on engagement in the workplace because the two are highly correlated. All right, enough for the facts for now. We set out to start Corporate Rebels to simply make work more fun, to find a solution to this problem and to ensure that we spend that, those 40 hours a week um, more valuable than what a lot of people are spending it now. So, back then, we had the idea to visit workplace pioneers all around. We shared this to friends and family, and the first response was, that is the most stupid idea I've ever heard. You're going to start a company, you're going to quit your job, but you don't have a business model, you have no clue how you're going to make money. You're going to live in one um, apartment, you're going to share the same bedroom, live on chicken and rice for a couple of months to make sure you can actually afford those travels. People really thought we were crazy and it was just this childish idea of traveling the world to visit these people and then nothing would come out of it. Luckily, now, two and a half years later, things have taken off a bit and we have actually found ways to not only research this topic, share it to a wide community out there, but also find ways to support companies to put this stuff into practice. So we started Corporate Rebels with that idea, and the main thing that we had was a website with on it one important page, our bucket list. And as you might know, bucket list is a list of things that you want to do or see before you die. We made a bucket list of pioneers we wanted to visit, organizations, academics, CEOs, um, who could teach us something about making work more fun. So the, here's a small snapshot of that list. Some names might be familiar, like, for example, Tom Peters, uh, Simon Sinek, Spotify, Google, the well-known workplace pioneers. But the more interesting ones on that list are actually the ones you probably have never heard of. An organization called Buurtzorg in the Netherlands, where 14,000 nurses work with not a single manager in the entire organization, performing way better than all the other competitors in the Dutch market, and therefore now also transforming those organizations to other parts of the, other parts of the world. Um, manufacturing companies where employees set their own working hours, their own salaries, um, healthcare, governmental organizations all around, companies and organizations that really challenge the status quo in how work is organized. So we set out to visit them, spend time with their employees to understand what it is like to work in such an organization and to get a sense of what they do different than the more traditional organizations out there. The list, this is just a small part of that list. It has now more than 100 organizations and pioneers on it, of which we visited about 70 now. And the list continues to grow. So if more inspiring examples uh, um, uh, pop up, then we go there, research them, and share it on our blog and um, um, in all the stuff that we do. So, this is the website, for those of you who haven't been to it, this is where we share twice a week all the stuff that we learn. Um, so if you don't have anything to do for the next two years, there's more than enough for you to read on there about radical workplace pioneers and what they do differently. At the same time, we publish in some media outlets as well, and we work with some companies to actually implement the stuff that we talk about, because just talking like sessions like these and writing about it in the book and the blog that we have is not going to change the world. Actually, implementing this stuff is also required to change the way organizations work. So, we, what we want to do now is share some of the main trends of these organizations. Um, what do they do different in general compared to more traditional ones? But before we're going to share that, a short video clip that shows you why it's important to sometimes challenge the status quo and to not simply do things because other people are doing it like that or because we've always done things like that in history, but this one shows you very painfully and in a funny way why it is important to sometimes challenge the status quo.
And could you turn the sound on as well? No? Just one second. Because without it, it's a pretty shitty video. through HDMI. To this answer one. that question, we set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this. Or would you? After just three beeps, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the group. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone, the crowd is gone, and nobody is watching her, except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? She's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Great, thanks. thanks so much. Think she'll teach the new guy what to do? We kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. And slowly but surely, what began as a random rule for this woman has now become the social norm for everyone in this waiting room. So painful to see, right? How easily we apparently adapt to certain social norms. Um, so imagine what happens in today's workplaces where people come in and start doing things because everybody else is doing it like that. This is mainly how we work still in organizations, even if we know as the, the numbers just showed, that in today's workplaces, so many people are still disengaged. So we set out to flip that and to figure out what can you do different in a workplace to actually make sure that people become more motivated. We're going to share the main trends of these organizations, but one important disclaimer, maybe the most important thing to take away from this session, it's not one solution. The eight trends is not some checklist that you have to uh, check all, all of the boxes to make sure you create a happy workplace. It just doesn't work like this. Some organizations show trends very clearly. Others don't show these trends at all. It's thinking about what your organization needs and what your organization wants, asking your employees, and then start starting to change it. Not listening to those management gurus out there who say you have to do these four or five things to become successful because it simply doesn't work like that. All right, so the first one. On the left-hand side, you see the focus of more traditional organizations. On the right-hand side, the focus of more progressive ones. So from profit to purpose and values. Not just solely a focus on making money, because that doesn't inspire a lot of people, mostly only the shareholders. Um, but moving beyond that and trying to actually contribute something meaningful to the world and doing that with a certain 
set of clear values that guide your decision making and the way you work. Profit, of course, is still important for almost any organization, even for not for profits or for healthcare organizations, because you need it to stay alive and you need it to grow your impact. But these organizations often compare it to oxygen for human beings. You need it to stay alive, but it's not the reason you exist. So that's the first trend. The second trend, from a hierarchical pyramid to a network of teams. So breaking down these old-fashioned hierarchical structures that have been developed 100 years ago, uh, but that don't work in today's fast-changing environment. So breaking down that hierarchy, breaking down those functional departments, and creating multidisciplinary teams where people work together and are fully responsible for their part of the business. From directive leadership to supportive leadership, so getting rid of bosses who tell people what to do and how to do it, and focusing much more on coaching, supporting employees, um, and, and making sure that the teams can do their work in the best possible way. From planning and predicting to experimenting and adapting, so from making long-term plans, budgeting cycles that take way too much time and that you then realize the next year weren't that accurate in the first place. Focusing much more on what can we do in the short term, how can we learn from those outcomes, and then change our course based on what we see happen, happening in practice. Number five, one of my personal favorites, from rules and control to freedom and trust. So getting rid of lots of rules and policies and procedures, and actually trusting people to make the right decisions, giving them the freedom to act in a certain way. Centralized authority to distributed authority, so bringing the decision-making power from the top of the organization, where it's very centralized, and pushing that down, especially to frontline employees, who are in closest contact with customers and suppliers and who need to be able to make decisions quickly, make sure they have the right information, but also the decision-making power to do that. And to give them the right information, trend number seven is from secrecy to radical transparency. How can you open up information so people have actually the right information to make decisions? Some organizations go really far and open up even salary levels, performance reviews, their budgets, um, and how their teams are performing up to a team level to make sure that people understand what they are doing and if their cha the changes they make in their business and the decisions they make actually impact their results as well. And then trend number eight, from job descriptions and fixed job titles towards talents and mastery. How can you get rid of those fixed day-to-day -day activities? And how can you focus much more on what people love to do, what they're good at doing, and actually crafting a job around those talents and around those skills? So these are some of the eight trends. Take a picture, share it on the internet, because as many people need to know that there's a different way of working out there simply to be inspired and to see what are some of the things that we can take from this and implement in our organizations to make sure our people love their jobs. So the eight main trends, what we want to do now is go into detail on two of them, supportive leadership and freedom and trust, to give you a case study of a company that we've been visiting and also some best practices of what these organizations actually do different in their day-to-day -day work. So the first one, before we're going to do that, a very quick statement that I want you to discuss with your neighbor for about a minute or two. So if you're not right next to somebody, scoop over a little bit and discuss the following. In my organization, there are no barriers between leaders and employees. So it's easily possible to approach a leader and to talk to that person, to challenge him or her. Um, or are there big barriers? And is it hard to talk to those people, to get the right information, to challenge them? Take one minute time with your neighbor to discuss that statement. One minute, go.
All right. Thanks for that. So, based on those discussions, who of you says there are no barriers between leaders and employees? Show of hands, please. No barriers. No barriers. Who says they have no barriers? All right. So, just a handful of people. Who think there are very clear barriers between leaders and their employees in their organization? All right. So, that must be the famous German hierarchy then, I guess. All right, so let's look at some of the organizations that challenge this and that think that barriers between leaders and employees should be minimized. We've been visiting a UK um, multi channel broadcasting company called UKTV. We set out to visit them because we heard some of their ins uh, inspirational practices. Um, and we went to visit them, talked to the CEO and some employees to understand what they actually do different. And their transformation story is quite an interesting one. So the CEO, when he joined that organization in the position as CEO, he said, we are a creative company. We have to come up with new television concepts, but we are very hierarchical in the way we are organized. And those two, in his opinion, didn't match that well. So people didn't dare to challenge, come up with new ideas, and initiate uh, new projects. So he said, we have to change this. So one of the first things he did was breaking down the walls of his office and of all the other managers' offices. He said, if we want to be closer to employees, to be able to share ideas and for them to be comfortable with initiating new projects, we need to make sure we reduce those barriers as much as possible. We need to support them instead of tell the, telling them what to do. So that's the first thing he did. Second thing they did was, besides uh, breaking down the walls of those offices, was turning the evaluations upside down. So instead of managers evaluating their employees, they turned this upside down and the employees or team members started to evaluate their manager. They made those manager evaluations transparent throughout the entire organization. So anyone could see where were underperforming leaders in the organization. He said, we have a zero tolerance for bad leadership. And while many companies say something similar, they actually put it into practice by making all these performance reviews transparent, because then they are able to act on it and to find ways to support those people to become better leaders. That's the second thing they did. Then they started to organize town hall meetings in which not only the management, but everyone in the organization could stand up and address certain topics, issues, uh, share successes, share barriers and failures that they made within the organization. They do this on a weekly basis. And he said these town hall meetings helped once more to reduce those barriers. But one very important symbolic gesture as part of those town hall meetings was maybe even more important, which was a big black box with a white question mark that they put in the office, where people could, in, could put in their questions, their challenges, their criticism um, against what was going on in the company. And he would open up that box on stage during those town hall meetings and answer those questions on the spot. Once again, to show there are no barriers between us, we are here to support you. If you have any questions, if you want to challenge us, please do so. UKTV, the results were definitely there. They doubled their market share in a couple of years' time. Profitability went up. Sick leave went down dramatically because of the changes that they were making in their organization. So some other things that organizations do to put supportive leadership into practice, because many companies say this, right? We want to become more supportive in our leadership, and we're going to train people to change their mindsets. Um, and then after a workshop of two days, they will be more supportive leaderships or more supportive leaders. This doesn't work that well, as we all know. So what can companies actually do structurally to make changes to become a more supportive leadership company? So the first one, we've listed some of the practices in order of rebelliousness, starting with the most simple one. Be aware of hippos. Not the animal that you see in the picture, but the hippo being the highest paid person's opinion. For example, Google uses this. Other companies use this in their meeting rooms where they put up such statements where they show to people, make sure you are beware of hippos and that you don't just listen to the person with the highest pay grade or the highest function, but actually listen to the content and discuss things based on content, not who that content comes from. Destroying the ivory tower and getting rid of status symbols. Think reserved parking spots for directors or for senior, man senior management. Uh, the offices that we just discussed before, sometimes either the top floors for just the board with fancier carpet than the rest of the building, 
all these childish things that show status to the people at the top that are counterproductive, especially if you want to reduce barriers and if you want to share information more openly within the organization. Leaders get, deliberately get rid of them to reduce those barriers. Evaluating your manager, as discussed before, so turning those evaluation mechanisms upside down. Splitting managers in coaches and specialists to make sure that you don't have the good salespeople to become sales manager, which is a totally different job. But in most organizations, we expect them to be able to do the two things both as good, which doesn't make any sense. And then there's the fifth one, which is the most radical, but also the most powerful one. Let people select their own manager or their own leader. Because the teams most often are the best capable of deciding who can bring them the most success and who's best able to lead that team forward. So selecting your manager, not many companies do this, but the ones that do it and that have transformed towards this show very good results because people become more engaged because they own the decision of who becomes their manager and therefore they also own the success of that team. All right, so some ideas that might spark some changes in your organization to create more supportive leadership. Then the next one, freedom and trust. And when you look at our bucket list, you often see, or the first response of people is, well, we see Google and we see Spotify, interesting tech startups, um, some of them based in Silicon Valley, and they all do this, these things and put it into practice. Well, I can tell you more or less the opposite is true. The most inspiring organizations that we come across are often not the ones that we all know of and not the ones that are based in Silicon Valley, um, but more often the interesting examples that you have never heard of because they don't sound that sexy. For example, this organization, it's a governmental department based in Brussels where a thousand employees work to provide uh, allowances to, di to disabled people in Belgium. This is one of the many things that they do. It's a governmental organization, it's a ministry, and this man that you see on the screen leads that organization or that uh, governmental department. When he started there, he said, we're going to do things totally different. But he didn't say that during his job interview process. During those interviews, he said, well, um, I'm going to lead this organization in a very traditional way. Command and control style, I will tell people how to do their job. We're going to optimize every part of the work to focus on effectiveness and efficiency. So of course, as you can imagine, he got the job because that's precisely the people or the person that they wanted. Once he got the job, he went into the organization and said, what I said during my job interviews is the exact opposite of what we are going to do. But if I told, would have told them that during the job interview, I would have never gotten a job. So let's now focus on how we can actually build a workplace where you love to work. So he started to have these regular discussions with employees. What is it that you want to change that currently frustrates you in the way we are organized? And a big problem for them was the rules and the procedures and the standardization that was in place that kept them from doing their job in a proper way and for using their own common sense and their brain to make the right decisions. So they started to make a transformation um, that's been going on for about 15 years already and they continue to become more radical. And to give you some examples of what they do, those thousand employees, they can determine wherever they work. So they can work from home, in a bar, um, in the office that they still have. Uh, for them, it doesn't matter as long as you get the right results. So on an average day, only 10% of the people, about 150, 120, are in the office to do their work, and the rest is somewhere else. Nobody knows where. And the second thing that is interesting about them, they get to determine when they work. So if they prefer to work at night, go ahead and do so. If you think you're more productive at night, do so. Or if you want to work on a rainy Sunday and want to be free on a sunny Tuesday, then please go ahead and do so. We don't care as long as you get the right results. People can decide in which teams they work themselves, um, on what work they are actually focusing their activities and their energy. So it's very much focused on freedom and trust, and they got rid of lots of policies and rules that got in the way of people using their own decision-making power to do that. With the idea that if people can make responsible decisions at home, buying a house, buying a car, educating children, then why the hell if they come into the organization, we don't even allow them to spend 200 or 500 euros of company money. To him and to the rest of the organization, this didn't make any sense, so they started to change this. Some of the outcomes of them, since that transformation, so for 15 years already, you have a 10% annual productivity increase, and it continues to be like that even nowadays still. 
They have the lowest absenteeism of any organization in Belgium. When they put out a job vacancy in 2003, before the transformation, only three people replied on average. Nowadays, 57 on average reply to their job vacancies because they know what kind of workplace it is. At the same time, they are now preferred by 92% of the recent graduates of those governmental students. Well, before the transformation, only 18% applied to that organization. So if you talk about the war on talent, if you talk about uh, making sure you don't have those high sick leave numbers, look at this example and what it meant for them to change their organizational structure to allow people to do the work in a better way. All right, so two examples. Um, what I want to share as well is some one transformation story to challenge you, to show you that it can be done, even if you're not the CEO of an organization, to change how your company works. Because most of the time we hear these stories and we think that's nice, but our CEO is totally different. The people in our leadership team are totally different, so this is never going to work. But this story shows you why that is not always the case and that you can actually make an impact, make a change, even if you're not in the top of your organization. There's a Dutch e-commerce company called Bol.com, um, where 1,500 employees work in a very similar way to what Amazon does. Uh, but in Holland, Bol.com is so successful that Amazon hasn't been there yet or hasn't started there yet. Uh, and this one guy who led a logistics team of 20 people had read about a lot of the case studies that we've been researching as well, and he got inspired by them. And he thought, we, as Bol.com as an organization, can work better too. So he made this nice plan, prepared his pitch, went up to the CEO, pitched his grand idea of changing the organizational structure and the way they worked. And then the CEO said, well, that's a pr really nice idea. I love your enthusiasm and your productivity, but it's not what we're going to do right now. We don't want to make this big transformation. We believe our way of working is already very successful, let so let's not change too much. So he went back to his team and he said, we can now do two things. So we can either listen to the CEO and just continue our way of working as we've always done, or we can start experimenting in our own part of the organization, so in our team of 20 logistics people, and we can see how much we can expand that internal change movement. So for three months, they started to experiment with new ways of working, more flexibility in the workplace, different ways of decision making in the team, alternative setup to their meeting structures, and they started to change all of these things for three months. And then they figured out, well, this is more or less the way of working that we actually want to have in the entire company as well. So what they did then, they had two things to show for them. First of all, the enthusiasm of those people. Secondly, they had measured some results of their increase in productivity. With those two numbers and with their enthusiasm, they stood up and said, we're going to go to every company meeting. We're going to write blog posts. We're going to share videos of our new way of working and our excitement about it to get others excited to jump on board that change movement. That was two years ago. Now, two years later, 1,000 employees in that organization have started working just like that team had started working two years ago. Simply by experimenting, going out there, communicating to employees, and then getting people towards you, attracting them, and training them then to do similar things. They expect that within the next 12 months, the rest of the organization will follow. So what this one team started doing two years ago has now transformed already two-thirds of a 1,500 employee organization, which shows that even if you're not the CEO or senior management of a company, you can still have a very large impact in how your organization actually works. So a valuable lesson based on this is start experimenting, start figuring out what of these things can actually work for you and how you can best put them into practice. Start communicating and try to build an internal change movement in your organization. And some valuable lessons can be learned from the very short clip that I want to end with. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. 
This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So the video continues for about a minute or so, but I think you get the point. You don't have to take off your shirt, drink a bottle of alcohol to get a movement started, but you need to start experimenting to actually change the way organizations work and start an internal change movement also in a company if you don't necessarily think you can do it. So we invite you all to be rebels and to find ways to make changes in your part of the organization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Pim, for this uh, talk that was at least as inspiring as engaging. Uh, thank, thanks a lot. Um, how big is your movement? As you have been the one who's been dancing first, if I got that right. Yeah, so, we took so off we, our <laughs> shirts first. Yeah, yeah. Um, does, it depends how you actually want to uh, um, um, define the movement. But on this Slack community that we currently have, where yeah. people communicate and share ideas and share best practices and case studies, we have now over 2,000 people in there yeah. uh, from around the world who are excited about this stuff. Um, and then there's the people who read the blog, uh, which is, of course, way bigger than that, um, uh, which you could also be called part of the movement. But more and more people get along and feel that change needs to happen, but also feel that there are actually alternatives to the ways of working and that they want to experiment with those things. I understand it's, it's a bit hard to understand really what you are. You're, you're a strange mix of being a platform, uh, a publishing company, a consultancy. Uh, how, how would you yeah. describe that? I mean, you're at the intersection of all of them, right? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to put into one sentence. The, mo the question we get asked the most often is how the hell do you guys make your money? But let's not start with that. So the, the main idea is we started out, our first business model was uh, to burn through our savings. Yeah. And we were quite successful doing that. Excellent. Um, good start. Good start. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we started writing and, and blogging and, and writing a book at the moment, which Joost is, is mostly doing, is still one of the main parts of what we do. So researching these companies and then sharing our, our ideas through this blog and, and the book. At the same time, also, uh, um, um, our activities are presentations and workshops, yeah. um, but also actually supporting companies to transform, yeah. to make sure that actually change happens, not just through talking and writing, but actually doing it and putting it into practice in companies as well. Yeah, we, we've seen some, some, some names of the companies, right? There was Daimler. Uh, yeah, was, uh, put some German ones on there as uh, well. Oh, uh, excellent, <laughs> excellent. Now, uh, the normal way uh, to close this session would be to do a Q&A here. But obviously, Pim doesn't do it the normal way. He's going to invite you to a sort of mini workshop. W what will going to happen yeah. in that mini workshop? Yeah, up front, we were told to do a meet and greet which no. is definitely not what we want to do. Now, what we want to do is to have a deeper conversation with people that are actually inspired by this stuff and that want to find ways to put this into practice. And then mostly, we set up a new uh, consulting brand, which is going to be launched in a few weeks' time under a separate name, uh, which is called Revolt by Corporate Rebels. Um, and we want to talk about people who are interested to actually putting that stuff into practice with that consulting brand, Revolt. Excellent. So 
everybody who thinks that could be interesting, so all of you, are very much invited to join PIM uh, in the executive saloon, which is right at the other end uh, of this section, and do the first mini workshop to kickstart the revolution the, the way you've been describing. Yep. Hartelijk bedankt, Pim, for this wonderful talk. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot. Thanks. Pim Marin. And we'll have a short break here on the uh, key keynote uh, uh, stage, and we're going to uh, restart at uh, noon with uh, something that fits very much with what you say. We're going to then have um, Dirk Müller, CEO of Schacht1 from Haniel here, who will uh, present the learnings that Sch Haniel, the Haniel company, has already made uh, through their digital transformation journey. Thanks a lot. See you back in about 45 minutes, or no, in an hour. Thanks a lot. And please feel welcome to join uh, uh, Pim.